Good evening, and welcome to the British Library. Uh, welcome to those of you who are here with us in the magnificent entrance hall of the library here in London, uh, and welcome to those of you watching online as well. Uh, my name's Jamie Andrews. I look after our cultural programming and our learning and education work here at the BL, and uh, I am thrilled uh, that on today, the publication day, uh, we are able to host uh, the launch of a new book by Xiaolo Guo. Uh, it's called Radical, and you will hear more about Radical, and you will hear from Radical uh, this evening. It's, uh, I think a new book by Xiaolo is always a thing to celebrate, and that's what we're doing tonight. Uh, but for us, it's even more special because this uh, launch is part of uh, the programming for an exhibition that we have on at the moment called Chinese and British. And it's one of the, uh, I think, one of the, more, one of the most meaningful exhibitions that we've done in recent times. And that's the stiff competition there. Um, it's an exhibition that goes back 400 years to the early 1600s, looking at the first recorded visitors from China to Britain and then taking that story through to the present day, and by working with British Chinese communities, uh, we're able to, to ask the question, and hopefully at least to partially answer the question of what it means to be Chinese and British today. Uh, it's um, a moving exhibition, it's an informative exhibition, it's a free exhibition, that's worth saying as well, uh, but it's only open for another couple of weeks. It closes on the 23rd of April, so if you haven't yet had a chance to visit that exhibition, please do so. Uh, and by the way, I should say that exhibition, amongst many objects, features the work of Xiaolu as well. So uh, that's all exciting. Also exciting is that this evening Xiaolu is going to be in conversation with the equally brilliant writer and translator Lauren Elkin, who you, I'm sure, will know for her books, uh, uh, Flaneurs, Women Walk the City, uh, number 91, 92, Notes on a Parisian Commute. She was the translator of a recently, uh, re or recently first time published unknown work novel by Simone de Beauvoir. Uh, uh, and Lauren also has a new book out slightly later this year, and her new book is called Art Monsters, Unruly Bodies in Feminist Art, and that's going to be published this July. So two great writers in conversation. Uh, we want you to be part of the conversation as well, so when the time comes, if you're here in the hall, in the room, please just put your hand up for questions and please wait till the mic comes to you so that people watching online can uh, hear your question. Uh, and if you're watching online, uh, as of now, beneath the screen, there is a chat box or a question box. Uh, please feel free at any time to, to, to type your question in and we'll make sure that gets fed into the discussion later. Uh, final thing from me is to say that after the event, if you're here in the hall, uh, we have books, uh, I think we have all the books by Xialu and uh, uh, Lauren here for sale. So I highly recommend that you buy as many of those as you can. And when you've done that, Lauren and Xialu will be very happy to sign books as well. So do stick around. If you're watching online, uh, you don't need to feel left out because there is at the top of your screen a buy books uh, 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 button which will take you through to our online bookstore. So no excuse not to. Uh, that's it from me. You're, we're going to have an amazing evening. And now uh, uh, all that it remains for me to do is to ask you to welcome to the stage uh, Xialu Guo with Lauren Alkin. Thank you. Hey, hi everybody. This is such a trippy place to do an event, my god. I'm usually like rushing in and out, going up and down escalators and, you know, putting my stuff in the lockers downstairs. But to actually stop and pause in this amazing kind of space and see you all here to celebrate the launch of Shalu's new book. This is just, this is such a, such a thrill. Um, so the book is so beautiful. Look at this amazing photograph of Jalou. This is by the Brooklyn Bridge. I was just asking her off stage, so like, is this, is this the cover? This isn't just the proof that I have. And she said it was a, a New York photographer who snapped this amazing kind of moody green and orange photograph, um, not in the famous part of the bridge, but is this like just as you are about to get on it or off of it? I don't know. I like the idea of the bridge. Um, 
Anyway, so I am meant to introduce Xiao Lu, so, and we discussed this just beforehand in the green room. I'm, I'm not going to look at the um, description. I'm just going to do it from memory slash, I don't know, from fiction. So this is Xiao Lu Guo. She is the author of 19 books, she was telling me backstage, and a number of films. We didn't talk about the exact number, and I don't actually know how many films you've made, but I think it's hugely impressive that you've written 19 books and made films. Puts us all to shame. Um, Xiao Lu is the author of an incredible book called um, A Lover's Discourse, which I read just this week in preparation for this event, and a concise, okay, China, maybe I even should like, look at the actual, I'm just making a fool of myself upstairs. Um, okay, a concise Chinese-English dictionary for lovers, which was shortlisted for the Orange Prize, um, and a recent memoir called Once Upon a Time in the East, which won the National Book Critics Circle Award, it was shortlisted for the Costobiography Award and the Rathbones Folio Prize 2018. This woman is not messing around. She's a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and a visiting professor at the Free University in Berlin. Um, and she's done a lot of other stuff in her life. We're here to talk about this book, which is a memoir of the time that she spent, I think, as a visiting professor at Columbia University, which you don't spell out in the book. It's just kind of something that is left hanging in the ether. Um, and yeah, again, it's a book about discourse, about dictionaries, about etymology, about the way that language ties people together and separates them and the ways in which we're constantly, constantly battling with the languages that have been, we've inherited or that have been imposed on us or that we find our way into. Um, and I think probably the best way to get us started uh, talking about this book would be for you to give us a little reading, if that's okay. Sure. Okay. I will start so reading on. the early sections, I think. Uh, so this will be nine minutes, I hope, exactly if you bear with me. <clears throat> so the books return as very short sections because I'm a very impatient person. So I can't write more than two pages and then I get up. And that's why all my books, after two pages, you're free. And there's no continuity. And you can you know, turn other pages randomly and go on. And it's a freedom of breathing. I actually find it difficult to read narrative books if it's very, very tightly <coughs> woven, I find that almost like in the, in the jail of the narrative, which I absolutely anti that. So these two little sections, one is called the Hudson River, and another one is called the Molting, as in a crab, a little creature coming out from the old skin. And that's in the end of chapter one. Like a sleeper worker, I wandered without direction. I was aware that there were no stars at all in this part of New York. Even the Hudson River was completely illuminate, illuminated by both sides of the cityscape. And in New Jersey was out there with millions of lit buildings, as awake as Manhattan. I walked down the slope of the river bank. I noticed my shoes were wet, and one foot was on a rock, submerged in the water. I could, I could see almost everything on the fluid surface. I could see algae, some little drifters, a Coke can stuck in between branches. I bent down and half sat on a branch, which spread out behind me. I saw something moving in the wet sand. <clears throat> a little creature. I brought my face closer. I could not see what it was. An airplane passed above me, then another. I looked up. Were they coming or going? I looked down into the sand again. And this time, I saw a little crab digging in and out beside my feet. A crab, gray, modest, and discreet. Then it disappears in the water. I waited for a while by the Hudson and to see if I would find the little creature again. It must have been past midnight by now, and I decided to return to my apartment. 
I went back to the bed and I read about crabs molting. When a crab molts, the old shell softens and erodes away, while a new shell forms. At the time of shedding, the creature takes in a lot of water so that it will expand, and it can crack open the old shell. The creature must then extract all of itself, including its legs, the lining of the digestive tract, its mouth parts, and eye stalks. This is a very difficult process that takes many hours, and if a crab gets stuck, it will die. I could not help trying to imagine the two eye stalks being prized out of their encasements. After this process, the little crab is finally free from its own boning prison, but it is extremely soft, and it must hide until its new shell has hardened. So the little thing I saw in the shadow of the Hudson River could have been hiding away after molting, or might it have been on its way to mate? Apparently, mating happens just after a female crab has shed its own skin. The home of crab is its own shell. It lives in that home for a while, then abandons it, and then creates a new one. And that's not unlike us humans. Our house is the exterior of our bodies, and we can move out or abandon it, and then make a new house. But some people get stuck in their lives, and they are unable to come out. Just like some crabs, they die in their old skin, unable to fully molt. Now the heating was too high. I opened my windows and stood there for a while, watching the sky and the river below. While the chilly wind blew my hair, a tumble of thoughts flew about like troublesome insects. I thought of the fact that I was in the U.S. by myself, having left my child and her father in England. What I was doing here? Pacing around at midnight in this foreign city, perhaps I was searching for adventures and encounters, and ultimately, some sort of freedom that I had <coughs> never had in China, oh, in Britain. But what was this freedom? Illusion, delusion, or unrealized possibility? Or was it the freedom beyond a woman's house, with or without a room of her own? My thoughts were insubstantial and weightless. The night river was real, and so were the lights of New Jersey on the other side. Was there freedom in this city? When I thought of women's freedom, then I thought of children, family, possessions. I thought of the physicality of female bodies, and the judgments of society. To find freedom, you have to be able to describe yourself, that self, and where you are in your own life. I knew that a vocabulary fit to describe the limits of women's freedom. Had already been forged by generations of feminists and by contemporary social media, but this is a generalized vocabulary for all women, whether white or black, whether working or unemployed, whether married or single. And in this, I could not find a lexicon for myself. Each woman needs to find her own words, that private, special vocabulary she can use to express her condition. And to make these words her own, she needs to embark upon an etymological journey, 
deep within herself. And the words that will be in her possession can be shared, but not turned into slogans. They cannot be taken away from the particular. And in that sense, I'm neither woman nor Asian. I'm neither worker nor oppressed citizen. I am just a human who cannot overcome or deny a very specific past set in stone, real and rich in detail, loaded with finely wrought mesh of social baggage. I had been enveloped in the sense of my own troubled reality since I arrived in this country, America. I felt threatened by deep separation from my past and by being in between worlds. I was experiencing a dreadful sense of incompleteness, a thick melancholy like the fog upon the Hudson lay on me. If a crab had its own private lexicon, fit to describe its own sentient history, then what is my lexicon which describes this being that I am? I, this person looking out at the dark river now, had these feelings that couldn't be caught in the net of ready-made words no, paved over by any familiar lexicon. And if we are honest, we must acknowledge our deep need to communicate, to go beyond this rigid vocabulary of feminism and politics, and to reach for an etymology that is authentic yet remains uncategorized. Thank you. Thank you, Xiaolu, and thank you for reading that particular um, set of moments from the book, because it sort of jumped around, and a lot of it were, were like moments that I specifically wanted to ask you about, so I think that sets us up very nicely for our conversation. Um, I, I have to say, and I mentioned this just in the green room um, before, it was such, a, such an uncanny experience reading you writing about New York. I'm from New York. Um, and you, so I'm from there, you're from China. We've met in Britain, a place where you've moved in 2002. I just moved here a few years ago. Um, both of us have maybe sort of uneasy relationships to this place, but we're here. Um, and now you've gone to New York and written about my home and you write so beautifully about the city that it made me like physically, you know, long for it. And you write a lot about nostalgia and, um, and, and, and the difficulty of understanding where we're from, where we came from, and what made us. And so it was just, it was kind of, it was really interesting to see you musing so much about China and your own background and how you were formed through looking at my city while I'm thinking about, you know, how I was formed there, look, you know, reading you writing about China. It was just a really interesting kind of mirror image. Um, kind of experience. So I don't know, I, I, I think my first, the first place that I wanted to start is maybe more general and then we can come to talk about New York um, and feminism and, and all, of, all of the really thought-provoking stuff that you've just raised. Um, and just ask what, very basically, what is a radical and how are you using that term in this book? How is, why is that the title? How, how can that be our way in? Sure, thank you. So. I should formally thank you, um, Lauren, to interview me because this is the first time and then the book is out, then no longer I belong to the book or the, the book doesn't belong to me anymore. But I remember <laughs> reading your book some years ago when I was living in Berlin, the, f the book about Flaneurs, being Flaneur, and I thought, I love this book. Who is this woman? <laughs> Lauren Akin. I know it's funny, that's really six, seven years ago then now I met you. And uh, it, it's somehow, you know, speaking to me, our, our vision, our shared sensibilities about cities and a female body in the city 
in the, in, especially in the foreign city, try to make life or try to seed ourselves, try to grow a, 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 you know, the body as a tree, to grow a family in a foreign country. And I think I share so much you know, from your books and your new book, The Art Monster, as well. So come back to your question, <laughs> radical. So radical, basically, Chinese words, bu shou. Bu shou meaning the roots, the body parts of one Chinese ideogram, which is han zi or kanji, if you're Japanese. So that's the basic building block of Chinese character, radical. And in a way, it's nothing so special, because in Latin, you guys have radis, which is R-A-D-I-X. It's the same. You know, you, so the building block in the Western alphabet language, you have these roots. But the difference is our roots is pictorial. It's the ideogram, either ideogram or pictogram. <coughs> Therefore, the way we write, perhaps, is through this visual imagination. And also, perhaps, because the composition of our Chinese characters in this basic radical, so we have, let's say, you know, basic, some hundreds of radicals or less, and you build your etymological understanding from those visual existence, um, which is not phonetically based at all. But in the Western language, or the written language, you have alphabet. So it's a sound, a speech-based written language, which is so different from Chinese East Asian, the pictorial language. And I think that's where I began. It's almost, I think, the page one. I had to basically explain or introduce in a subtle way. This book is to introduce you this dual landscapes, culturally, linguistically, and hopefully, hopefully <laughs> just the, 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 the urban spaces, you know, in, in New York, and um, my memory about my, my Chinese landscape, Chinese urban spaces, and then my recent life in Britain, which is really more or less last 10 years. Before that, I was living in Europe for, for about 10 years. So, so this was the foundation of this book. Yeah. And so the, uh, the other meaning of radical is the one that we're more familiar with, of, you know, something avant-garde or... Yes, something. yes, I didn't mention that yet mm -hmm. because I, I thought, that's good, you mentioned it. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I would love to call myself radical, but, you know, what is radical these days is being completely non-radical. Being Zen Buddhist is the most radical thing. <laughs> and I'm a Zen Buddhist because uh, I'm very um, distant from this kind of public life, and so I hide, and I sometimes extremely cynical, so I don't come out. So that's been radical. So, so I mean, it's amazing, because in Chinese words, radical, bush, or doesn't have that avant-garde connotation. Mm -hmm. So I play with these words, of course, in, the, in this word, plural, mm -hmm. singular, in this book to suggest what is radical? You know, what is a radical way of living as a woman artist? And maybe an artist is overrated, or just as a woman, or as a human being in the end, to live. So I use those vocabulary, for example, ubermash, mm -hmm. the Nietzsche's words, um, superman or overman. But then we don't have urban, urban woman. <laughs> so so I, I just want to pick out those very, very basic vocabulary or, you know, it is a book of etymological um, discussion about way, you know, human existence in those urban spaces and we try to plant our life and launch into the world in a more organic, more authentic way. Mm. I learned so much reading the book of being about etymology that I was completely unaware of. For example, I had no idea that the word for radish Radi in French is the same as the root for radical and in all of its different senses. And then you have this most amazing moment in a Chinese restaurant, I think it's in New York, yes. um, where there's like lamb and radish on the menu and it becomes this moment for this one paragraph is this like moment of reflection on like antique Chinese poetry and I think there's painting in there too, and lamb, and radish, and root vegetables, and I think maybe is that the moment where you talk about the sky being tall and the earth being old? It's this incredibly dense paragraph that also just reads like, 
it's a woman in a restaurant, you know, thinking some thoughts, like Flennes style, you know, Flennes goes to a restaurant. Thank you. I think that's one, maybe the section made you homesick about New York, you told me. One of them, yeah. The nostalgia about New York. I think uh, I'm glad I kept that section because that section went very long. Um, I do not like long sections, so the one I read actually is a combination of three sections. But in the real book, I cut down because I do not believe that your, I mean mine, the, 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 the stretch, the threshold of the concentration. So I want to respect your kind of, <laughs> and my kind of this internet age kind of, you know, really the, 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 the focus level. So I made a very short. And that section about radis, radical, the soup made from radis, radish, in Queens in New York, uh, it was just so important to me because as I lived there, you know, from Harlem to Queens to that restaurant, it took me about an hour, 40 minutes, <laughs> by three kind of different trains from up Manhattan, go all the way to Brooklyn and then go back to Queens just to get to that restaurant. And I think it's, it's profoundly sad, your nostalgia about your country become just one dish and going through nearly two hours trip in a, another foreign continent. And I think that's my relationship. I mean, all, I guess, most of you, you know, especially from non-Western culture, you know, how could I have the food my mother cooked to me, mm -hmm. which is not Italian, not Spanish, but a Japanese dish or a Chinese dish, you know, that is so profoundly different <laughs> from the Western <laughs> European dish and with chopsticks. And I think that is pathetic and profoundly sorrowful for a writer who, uh, and a filmmaker who was making film during that time to just kill that to us to get that dish. And I managed to write this very important Tian Chang Di Ju from Lao Zi Dao De Jing in that restaurant because I heard this boy was saying that mm -hmm. pop song, which is in the most tacky way, but the original words Tian Chang Di Ju, the sky high, the earth old, which was, you know, one of the most ancient kind of phrase or idiom from Chinese literature, you know, it's more than 2,000 years old. So I cooked that together mm. with radis soup. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I wrote that, I remember, in that restaurant when I was eating my radis soup. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it, it, I subscribe to The New Yorker and every week they, they talk about different restaurants that, you know, you absolutely must check out if you're in New York. And, you know, that it just makes me cry. Like this past week it was, something just on the edge of Queens, almost in Nassau County. I'm from Suffolk County, which is like the less, you know, fancy part of Long Island. Um, and it was located on Jericho Turnpike. And I just, it was like a knife, like, oh God, Jericho Turnpike. Like you just turn, if you go really far onto Long Island and then make a left and then a right, you'll be at my parents' house. And so reading that section in the context of my kind of regular reading of The New Yorker in order to stay in touch with home, it felt like another kind of New Yorker goes to Jackson Heights and you really have to go to this restaurant. Also, you can have this amazing reflection on um, Chinese poetry while you're there. Um, but so why is New York then the setting for these thoughts about radicality and etymology and finding a, a lexicon for the self? Oh, well, that's very complex question because actually it began with Walt Whitman. Um, I mean, half of my life was making films. I'm, I'm a documentary person, which means all my books are documentary. And my films, you know, half, I made a dozen films, most are long films. Most of fiction films are also done in a pure documentary way. And it's up to you to call it what fiction documentary. I do not function with those terms. So I was making a film to do with Walt Whitman and I'm still trying to finish it. And uh, so that was the beginning. I was in Harlem. I was recording, you know, the people, you know, the, the Spanish, the immigrants, the, 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 the Africans, you know, the, the, the new and old immigrants live in Harlem. And I was asking every person in the street, which they allowed me to do it, to read one poem from Leaf of Grass. Then I would film them. And the project went on, you know, for, for quite a while. And I thought that process is so much about America. What is America and what is in New York? Because what Whitman actually began in New Jersey, then came to New York, and then he became this great figure in this, uh, in this newspaper called The Eagle, which is by the Brooklyn Bridge, where I was, this photo was taken, actually under his building. 
And then he was sacked by the newspaper because he was very big advocate to anti-slavery. So he wrote articles about how terrible slavery, and then the newspaper said, then man, you had to go. And he left, and he, <laughs> he went to, into woods, being naked, and wrote all these great poems. <laughs> and so I got people in Harlem that year to read one particular poem called I Hear America Sing, because I think that is the one about America Zen with such optimistic beauty and strength. And America now, you know, right after Trump, actually during the Trump when I was living there, it was so weird that year, you know, the Trump was leaving that year, and, uh, and um, it was despondent. And uh, people, you know, just swear in front of my camera what, during the reading of Whitman. And I thought, then I hear Americans saying, how could I find a modern, Walt Whitman. Hmm. Then I found one, and I think also it was in this section called Kenichi Hall. So one day I was in New York Public Library, and I was in a park in front of that library called Bryant Park. And then I saw a man who was selling his little poems. And I was this you know, idiotic person. I bought one of his poems. Of course I buy, because that's how my life is. I ask you to buy my poem. It's just slightly thicker than his, his edition. And then, then he suddenly began, so his name is Mr. Robertson. He said, I love Walter Whitman. And then my eyes immediately, <laughs> literally, I said, tell me more. He said, well, I am the modern Walter Whitman. I am. Yes, great. He's homeless. So but the modern Walter Whitman is homeless and self-published. Well, he said, I am self-published, just like Walter Whitman. I am self-taught, never schooled, just like Walter Whitman. The only difference is I'm homeless, and I followed him every day. So that was my friend, and I went to see him. I think he was there every Wednesday afternoon, and then every some kind of Saturday afternoon. And then one day I went there, he wasn't there anymore. Then he told me a, a place where, I can't remember, a, 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 a lodging place which is like for homeless people to live. So that was the, the end of my, my Waterman story, and I wrote down his name, and I wrote that section, really dedicated to him. And then I tried to find him. He's no more. Hmm. So I thought about, this is in New York. <laughs> you know, could I find the, the, the great Whitman in the street? And if <laughs> I find him, you know, who is he, right? Would it be me, homeless, rather than, you know, a, a 17th century poet had a dignity, lived then, you know? And um, so it's, it's really about this, launching to this world so nakedly without support as artist. Mm -hmm. And I was having support when I was living there teaching, you know, have salary. But uh, there's a great sense of this ex existential loneliness and uh, it's kind of ontologically emptiness there in the street. And, um, and that's, uh, that's when I began to write mm. this book. Mm. Um, funny little side note about Walt Whitman. He was born in the town next door to my town, Huntington. That's um, right. And our mall is named after him. So I grew up going to the Walt Whitman Mall. Connection. Yeah. Leaves of Grass is inscribed, well, a, a verse or two of it is inscribed so, on the side of the mall. That made you also <laughs> nostalgic. <laughs> I, I do. I love Walt Whitman. Um, I loved that you, you described him as the quintessentially American poet, and then you went on to say that you couldn't really distill down anything as quintessentially Chinese. So I thought it was interesting. I wondered what made you think that Whitman is... I mean, I think it's something... It's a truism. We all say he's the quintessentially American poet. Um, but is, is he... Is he still the quintessentially American poet for America today? I mean, the Trump's America. Well, today, of saw. course, you are completely de decentralized. Yeah. I mean, like us, you know, maybe British Library <laughs> <laughs> is a, a center in the East North London, but we're all completely fragmented, right? Our lives. I mean, just like us, you know, I moved so many times, and could we move again when you dragged along the family? So we get old mm. and we are planted. Or I use another word, which is more negative, cemented, mm. cemented onto the ground. But the positive word is seeded, planted. Mm. And uh, I think what Whitman is also another thing I could bring out my childhood memory about my father in this, mm -hmm. in this book. And I think 
it anchors my way of writing. Otherwise, you are having this fragmentary experience reading my book, you know, so I do need a kind of thread for, for my kind of literature. Mm -hmm. So this notion of roots, you know, runs through the book in terms not only of, you know, etymo etymological roots, um, but in terms of roots like where the kind of figurative, where do we put down roots? Can you move somewhere and put down roots there? What constitutes putting down roots in a place? Um, and then you write quite a lot about your garden, which I really loved. Um, and the way that you write about um, the soil and getting soil under your fingertips and the kind of just the, like what soil is composed of, like dead plants and animal, I don't know, it's very like, it's very organic and, and er earthy, I guess, um, for want of a, a better word. And yeah, I guess I, I, I myself struggle with the notion of how to put down roots. I lived in France for 20 years, it's still my home. Um, ha have I really put down roots there even though I don't, you know, have an apartment there right now, I don't have any family there, like, but it's still, you know, are those roots kind of imaginary and in my head? Do they really exist? How can I make them exist more strongly in the world even though I live here and my life is here and my child is here? Anyway, so I just was really, I connected very strongly with this mm. idea of rootlessness and then of the seed kind of blowing through the world. Well, thank you. I, it's, it connected to my past. I'm a really agricultural person. You know, my family, they were fishermen and peasants. My, my father's family was a generation of fishermen, and we were Hui, Muslim, Hakka people, so drifting around. My mother's family was just a, this pure peasant by generations, so they grow yams, sweet potatoes, and tea. So I grew up in this absolutely agriculture, non-urban landscape. Um, it could be quite urban too. I mean, these days, those landscapes become urbanized completely, but I. I do feel this connection deeply with peasants' life, which is different from farmer's life, because the Western word farmer is different from peasant. And the French word paid peasant, so mm -hmm. it's different connotation of farmer. Especially use English word farmer. Well, since this is a book about lexicon <laughs> etymology, I just want to be very careful with it. I am a peasant daughter, and I'm proud to be a daughter from that background, and which made me feel rootless. When I left China, I was 30 years old, which means I had completed my life you know, for 30 years in China, um, published 10 books, I had my family, my own family, and all that. So if you immigrate when you were 13, you are, you are okay, you're Conrad, you're Kafka, you are, you are fine. If you're immigrant when you are 30, from non-European culture is tragic mm -hmm. in the sense there's nothing you can really sort of share. There's no common sense. And I think we are not this privileged cosmopolitan as youth would thought. We are forced to immigrate. I mean, in my case, I had to. I had no choice but leave, to leave China. So the, the leaving home is completely just bend the bridge. And it's very sorrowful, you know, I'm a first generation immigrant. And in my village, no one ever left the village. No one went to university. So I was one of the only one left my village, which is very different as someone from Norway living in Britain or, I mean, I dare not say that, but you know, a, a, a German living in England, you know, you do share a certain kind of European knowledge. But in my case, I do not know anything when I came because I didn't have English when I came as a 30 years old woman. So I think the rebuilding roots is pathetic through my four square meter garden, which was concrete and it's still concrete. And how do I build it? So <laughs> but I dispatched myself again to another continent, which is the third continent in the, in the US. Because once you lost, you don't have any more. Mm -hmm. And you keep going to look for it. And we are romantically idiotic people. Mm -hmm. We thought that there's a home there for you. And no. And now, mm -hmm. I guess we found a home, which is literature or filmmaking or mm -hmm. art. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then there's a kind of paradox at the heart of the book, and that's one of your keywords, um, paradox, I think, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> if I'm remembering correctly. Um, this, and the, if I've understood you correctly, it's, it's to do, at least to some extent, with um, the difficulties around mobility and immobility as a female artist and 
and you know, member of a family. So I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about how that shapes your experience, how gender or maternity shapes your experience of mobility in the world. Yeah, I think that's, that's very much connected to the bit I read. Mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult when you are quite ambitious and when you're women yeah. and when you're immigrant, it's morally condemned if you're living in the very traditional society. And I think that's why I'm always fearful. I'm not liking to reveal myself too much in, the, in private life, but I think the paradox, thank you, the word. <laughs> the paradox is I write very privately. I'm a, I'm a documentary writer, I'm a diary writer. So my heroes are, were those women who wrote quietly, for example, and his name from the US or Duras. They don't write in the, in the historical sense or public sense. But I think the result is your private little that encasement completely exposed when the book becomes a public object. And I think that's a moment I found very strange, for example, tonight. Or, you know, even though I published quite a lot of books, more than a dozen books, but I always find that stage is, is very strange because that is not the purpose of writing. The authentic purpose of writing is the communication with, within the self which never dared to live. And I think my, my purpose of writing is I communicate as a social woman, as a mother, as an artist, as an immigrant, as someone who has some ideas and a certain ambition, <laughs> to that person completely private, incorrect most of the time, not PC, conflicted, depressed, traumatized, totally. So, so these two persons talking, and I think that's why I love this because all my books seem like two person talking. You know, they, they, they pretend to be a man and a woman in all my books, but they are just uh, this conflicted, mm -hmm. paradoxical individual who try to communicate mm -hmm. with all different languages to have a discourse. And come back more concretely to your question because you do ask a bit more relevant question about womanhood. I think it's impossible. I think. I mean, the, the paragraph I read about rigid vocabulary or feminism and then politics, I think, how could we live out of slogans, please? Mm -hmm. I come from a country which is a master of slogans. And I switched to write in different language, not because I don't like or love Chinese language, because I was born in the end of the Cultural Revolution. We were, have been, we have been writing a kind of Chinese which is sloganized, a little red mao book kind of Chinese, and I didn't want to write in that style, and I want to write in some kind of old Chinese, which is, you know, say, you know, before 40s, 1930s, or Lu Xun's language, or Eileen Zhang's language, or the Southern language, which I came from. So within my own linguistic system, I already had the decision I need to talk to the other person in a different language and to escape from this main sloganized vocabulary. And yet, where to escape? You know, I, as, if, as if I'm speaking a feminist language, yet that could be sloganized with empty meaning mm -hmm. and well meant, but I want to speak a certain kind of private lexicon. Mm. And I think it's very difficult to write a book with private lexicon because everything is overused, overwritten, it's abused, language is overly abused. You can't use the word love or you can't use the word red because it, 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 it falls for these incredible narratives, preoccupation, preconception, prejudice. Hmm. And I, my purpose to write this book is just, okay, here is my private lexicon. I'm going to use all kinds of language, for example, German, French. Mm -hmm. And with this German word I used in one section called Lebenskonstelle. Leben, actually, Lebenskonstelle, my accent. It means living artist or the artist of life, the artist of living through life or a person who lives whose life is like art project. And I thought that that is the only way to describe what I want to live. Nothing else. Lebenskonstelle.
mm. to live authentically, to be away from this propaganda language, whether in the West or East. Mm. And another French word I used in this book called, uh, um, um, now I'm suddenly this crack here, I couldn't remember. I think it's from D.H. Lawrence, um, Lady Chatelet. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, a, it's something to do with de la boue, enter the mouth. Oh, nostalgie de la boue. Nostalgia yeah. de la boue. And that is an amazing concept, meaning nostalgia for the dirty earth. Mm -hmm. And in D.H. Lawrence, Lady Chatelet, she went, well, I should use present tense, she goes with a lower class man who lives in the woods, who is basically a helper for this huge, rich estate. And the lady shall tell her husband said, well, you are uh, lower woman, you, you had this nostalgia de la boue. And I said, I love this word, I love this word, because that's how I felt. Mm -hmm. This incredible desire to go dirty, <laughs> to be improper, to love the earth, mm -hmm. to get my hands dirty, to be non-ladylike, to be away from this whiteness. And, um, and I, I, so I wrote that, and I think I wrote another section about D.H. Lawrence, about roots, I think, also connect to mm. that mm -hmm. novel, something like that. Mm. No, that's a really powerful section about D.H. Lawrence, and I think it's like the tree with the roots in the air or something that's like right. that. That's yeah. right, and his famous claim, which made him out of Britain because of moral judgment, he said that British people, the body and the mind went upside down, we divorce our body because of our rationality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I try to understand the Britishness, and I try to be in this country, so I think those words are interesting for me to study. Mm. Well, this is a good point to bring in. One of the major sort of aspects of the book, or, or like, I don't know, what takes up a lot of the book is, and here I, I want to be careful not to um, align too closely you, Jaou, the person in front of me with the narrator of the book, but you to say, you know, entre guillemets, in between quotation marks, have an affair with a guy called E. I'm assuming it's a guy. I think you used the, the, the pronoun he with him. Um, for, for much of the time that you're in New York, and that he becomes your interlocutor, that, as you mentioned a few moments ago, the kind of person with whom you undertake this back and forth about love and how to be in love, like how to, how to literally exist in the world when you're in that state and what you need from the other person and how they can help us to exist when we're so caught up in that moment of being in love and needing and physically needing. So I think there's a lot of very beautiful writing about the body and about sex and how you can physically need to be connected with another person. Um, I don't know if you want to go down that, that path or if you want to leave that to the side. Well, I think any book can needs narrative, yeah. even though you know, a journalist needs narrative. I mean, I think I don't like the, the, the cheap narrative, I don't like the plottings, which, but I do need a kind of metaphorical narrative, so, which is, so the book is shaped by a person in New York and then the, then the person here in Britain, and I think these are metaphorical characters. One represents my second home, which is Britain and one presents this brand new land, which is America. And then I can move between the three continents, which is China is the, the ultimate lost home for me. And I think for me, it's easier to go on this journey in this book in a, such a meandering way, but going through these two personalities. Um, so this is here and that is here. Um, but more or less they present the same thing. Home, home and the love, you know, and I think because I do not participate very much of this kind of collective joy, which means having a drink in the pub or, or see TV or watch TV, you know, I, I, I don't do this kind of somehow, you know, very ordinary pleasurable thing. I don't find it pleasurable and I loathe actually, in fact. So I basically have very private kind of hidden life, which I, I kept to myself and I have, you know, very limited, very close friends I might talk to. Because the way I write, I cannot really be a jolly pub person, you know, because that's called a release. Mm -hmm. And I think to hold on to it 
it's like, you know, b before the sperm goes, you know, you, you have all the narratives. And then she, actually, Barzak here said <laughs> famously, you know, Barzak said, well, if I could hold on in the morning when I woke up, I would have returned another 20 novels or something like that. You know, the quoting a male, a male velocity or male vitality is to hold on to that. Yeah. And I think for women, something similar is I do not like to release it, but I would hold it, and that's all in the book. Maybe the intensity you read is the actual mm -hmm. intensity physically, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that is one of the sort of, um, what's the word? If we're talking about like radical ways of living um, in addition to you know roots and radicals in that sense, um, leaving a partner and child on one side of the ocean to go to the other side and having an affair with someone on that other side and then coming back and then trying to make a balance of that. I mean, that is a very, very radical way of approaching family life. It's what I find so interesting narratively is that it doesn't, it doesn't torpedo anything. There's no, no, as I think you write, nobody left anyone, or maybe you said that in an interview. It's not about oh no, affair, what is this going to do to the family? It's about, maybe this is more of the tension that you're talking about, kind of holding in one life things that um, in the kind of moralizing tradition of marriage or studying abroad would, would decimate a life or decimate a marriage, but that doesn't yeah. happen. I mean, I, I, if I dare say, you know, I do not function in those terms, but I do, th do, take it seriously because I'm just a real person, you know. But then, fundamentally, I'm not. I'm completely sarcastic and anarchic about these things. And fundamentally, I think there's a section about being, you know, if you, there's a section called the Tour and Dot, and it's about being a Zen, being a social, you know, a Zen living in the urban techie world. You can be a commercial Zen, whatever. But in Tour and Dot, sex, that section, Puccini's opera, um, the story is, okay, the, the, the prince from Persia loved this Chinese princess, and he wanted to kill himself for that princess. And then in Toronto, there's a three Taoists. Somehow, Puccini wrote Taoists, very, very weird. Three Taoists came to tell this, this prince that there's no beautiful Toronto. There's only Zen in this world. It means there's no real love or beauty or object there for you. There's only this life which is unfathomable. It's, it's undescribable and it's completely temporary. The, the, what, I, what I really take is nothing is permanent. Everything is temporary. So I do not function those words like, you know, I, I don't even want to mention those words, I think. I just don't have that in me. And I think the, the temp temporality of our such a little life it's a joke of, <laughs> of you know, our human imagination. No, it's really like the, the quotation I use in my book, the Ubermash, mm -hmm. Ubermash, the Nietzsche's uh, quotation, you know, this vast, wild, crazy, tragic human imagination, and then this very limited, temporary, non-permanent human life there, and the suffering in between, and then my book is about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically. Um, so I have just one more question before I think it's going to be time to open things up more generally if you all, you all want to start thinking about what you might want to ask. Um, is really, so you have this really wonderful chapter, uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it, oh yeah, page 266, called Minor Languages, um, in which, of course, you cite Deleuze and Guattari. Um, hang on, we're going to get there. 266, la la la. Minor, minority. Um, so I, I don't even know which, oh, there's one, so the line at the very end of this, this chapter, mini chapter, you say, a writer can truly sabotage or reinvent a language which has been suppressed and ridiculed by colonial sensibility. Um, this, I find these, these two pages to be just so deeply important to me personally as a writer and then sort of collectively in the last, I don't know, 50 years of, of feminist thought. I mean, it brings up Adrian Rich and Bell Hooks and Kathy Park Hong and, and, um, and obviously Dillis and Guattari. And I just wonder, where do, we, where do we go from here with these kind of tired words um, that you've, you've worked so hard to kind of tunnel into and, 
and reinvent or find new life for? Like, where, where does it leave us sort of collectively as a culture here in the West? Well, that's a very big question. Oh, yeah. But, but thank you, mentioned that Deleuze is mm -hmm. minor, minor language that I quote. Um, originally, I, I think I quoted very long. And then I had to reduce, 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 because I don't believe in long quotation. Um, and now I think it's just a four, four lines. But it's a major essay, I think, for my life, for my all foreign life living in the West. I live for that four lines. Basically, Deleuze's idea is how to be a minor, right? I mean, the idea is how to live in this major language. You speak this major language, but still, you, are, you live in this nobility as a minor. Or can I just translate in my humble English? I ask myself, how do I live me, as a gypsy, living this major language, which is called English, but as a, as a minor in a very noble way, because I do not want to speak a, a commercial, mainstream language. I want to create my own minor language within this major language. And I think Deleuze suggests a lot of things. Of course, you know, Kafka was a real case. You know, Kafka was from Czech, you know, but he was writing in high German. And then his relationship to his own Czech linguistic tradition is incredibly rich and complicated. But yet, I'm not from a minor language. I came from Chinese language, which is very major, the biggest, you know, the major language. Yet I escape to another language I thought was minor language, but of course it's a huge mistake. You know, it's this empiristic, incredible, elastic English language. Yet this escaping is nowhere because I escape from this vast Chinese language writer writing life, which I published quite a lot in China. And then I move towards this English language, which is not quite British English, not quite American English, not Singaporean English, not Indian English, not Hong Kongese English, but my sort of strange English to write all my books. I do need that minor position to conquer this overwhelming kind of existence of this major language permeating my life. And I think that also suggests, you know, the word Lebenskunstler. How do I live like a Lebenskunstler, you know, as a minor? Um, and that is a freedom, you know, to be away from this main, this mainstream language, um, if I mm. could answer you. Mm. Yeah, yeah, completely. Okay, I think there's a roving mic. John, is there a roving mic? Um, you're the, yeah, John is the guy with the mic, I think, yeah. Okay, so I think, so it's very hard to see. I'm gonna do my best, but right there next to you. Hi, um, thank you so much, Shalu and Lauren, for such a brilliant and inspiring conversation. Um, I think what struck me was the constant references to nostalgia. Um, and as uh, someone who was born and raised in East Asia and who migrated to the West 10 years ago, I find myself constantly wrestling with the powerful force of nostalgia and also wanting to be present. Um, and I guess my question is, how much does nostalgia impact your present? You know, is it supposed to be avoided or embraced? Is it supposed to be forgotten or recreated? Thank you. Very poetic um, question. Um, I don't know if I can answer so poetically. Lauren, you're gonna help. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I used to be very much attached to the idea of nostalgia until one day I discovered it's a very unhealthy or politically dangerous concept. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in a sense, especially the last, you know, the last several years, you know, I think. And also the, I think we are in a very, very interesting place, you know, especially Britain, you know, the nostalgia for the past, the nostalgia for some kind of imperial identity, you know, and my own nostalgia for some kind of strange, self-centered, this huge culture called the Chinese culture, you know, I think, I mean, in my case, I think it was healthy for a while, but I found it unhealthy to recreate my work, my books and my films, because I had to abandon all. I have to abandon it in order to find the, 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 the intensity of my current life, in order to have immediate relationship to it. My immediate relationship to my daily life is through writing, through filmmaking. So, if I live in the nostalgia, I should go back to my village, which is called Shitang, 
which is on the coast towards Taiwan, I could swim across. But I do not live there now, so I felt that I must painfully embrace what's around me <laughs> um, to have a dialogue with nostalgia rather than going back completely. And uh, it's very complex concept. Mm. Okay, another question? I feel like there was another hand that I missed. I'm sorry, the lights are so bright, it's kind of hard to see. Anyone feeling brave? I'm just going to start talking about New York if you don't. <laughs> no one wants that. Okay, right at the front, thank you. On the front. Hi, thank you. Can you talk a bit about your writing process? Uh, is that radical too, or are you very kind of conventional in writing every morning from, I don't know, 8 till 12 or something? Yeah. Thank you, thank you. I, I don't know if neither radical or non-radical. I, I wrote very intensely, but uh, you know, I'm not very old, but I'm a very old writer because I, do, I wrote <laughs> Chinese books, I wrote 10 books, and the English books, I mean, published nine, so that's 19 books. You know, I, I despise numbers, but that means I did work a lot, a lot, a lot. And I also, I made quite a lot of films. So I think I'm sickly, despise some kind of chatty, insubstantial moments of life, which means I live very, just strangely, everything is going through the length of, of thinking of that, the writing material, you know, so I'm, I'm a, very difficult to say, you know, when I was young I wrote a lot. I, I didn't sleep, not because I want to write, because I was burned by the possibility of writing, because I grew up in a very poor village in South China. I didn't know anything until around you know, late, you know, late teens, and, then, and we were allowed to read Western literature at that time. So I remember, you know, because the Cultural Revolution continued, and then in the 80s, the Western books was allowed, so I <coughs> When I discovered, for example, Silver Plath, I was maybe 17 or something, or, or earlier, I was in the rage of loving those things, and I found, my God, I know how to write. So I imitated <coughs> those writing from the West, and the B generation, I remember. So I was just, a, I, I no longer interested in <laughs> physical life, so I wrote a lot, and intensely I wrote, and I didn't do anything in the school, you know, I wrote. And then I think when I, when I went to Beijing after my village, I wrote more systematically, which means I became more focused. So a story has its own focused research structure. So I become very practically focused on if the one story is about, say, uh, you know, I'm very interested in, in the street people, homeless people, you know, or in George Orwell's son's Trump. I mean, if I'm interested in that subject, I focus my everyday life in the street and I record them and I wrote about them and I only do one thing for a year or two years and it, therefore the writing become very intensely fast and condensed and then when I left China I came to Britain I was completely lost because I was in very slow Britain <laughs> and then I moved to Germany which is much slower um, I lost my language I didn't write I think for the first five years I was completely in pain because I, I wrote one sentence in English and then I spent next 20 minutes to change the verb conjugation because I didn't went to English school to study. I went to art school, study film. So I think the first five years in Britain I, I wrote, yeah, I wrote one or two books, but I didn't call that writing. I call that a painful verb conjugating time. <laughs> So I didn't write, I wrote a diary, and I, so far I still, you know, I, I wrote a diary. And I look at my diary, I said, well, there's no verb I write here. You know, they're all chaotically, because in Chinese language, we don't have a verb conjugation, so everything is present tense. So when I speak, you know, it's often chaotic, but during the writing, it's even more complex with the memory, all that layers. So now I don't write very fast. And uh, also life is short, and I realized when I had a child, all that, then I realized there's life. My God, there's <laughs> life. So I, I, now I, I got up, I would leave the house around 
very early, like 7 or 8, I hide in a little cafe. I work for 40 minutes because I don't believe in long sitting or long, long pages writing. So I might write one page and that's it. <laughs> then my day is done, I'm just exhausted. And then I try to do something during the day, you know, maybe revise a bit or that. But I think I, I try to write something I really want to write. I don't want to write anything on urgent. I will do that after I enter the graveyard, you know, any non-necessary <laughs> writing. <laughs> so, so now I'm careful, yeah. I think there's also people online who want to ask yeah, a question. Yeah, we have a question here from uh, Elisabetta, who's watching online and says, thank you very much for an uh, interesting discussion. And wants to know, is the uh, fragmentation of the new text, has it been influenced by Roland Barthes in the same way that A Lover's Discourse was, in a way to not order events chronologically, or is there another reason for the fragmentation? <laughs> thank you. It's complex. Thank you. I mean, it is, the, that's A Lover's Discourse, my previous novel, which is just direct homage, di direct salutation to Laurent Bart, which I think Lauren's expert maybe can help. Um, I never believed in a chronological sealed narrative. I almost despise that kind of writing because I think if, you, if you're a modern person, if you believe in writing is kind of brief with space, with communication, you do not force a traditional sealed story upon your readers or upon yourself because the life is chaotically broken up by distraction, <coughs> fragments, by disorientation, by, by interruption. Life is an endless string of inter interruption. And therefore, the same thing when I make film, I couldn't, I couldn't make, or I refused to watch a film with completely this sealed Hollywood traditional narrative. I mean, I can, of course, I can sit through during the Christmas time, but. I find extremely anti-life, and maybe, you know, our purpose of reading or watching film is to, to anti-life. But life is this chaotic throw, like Heidegger said, <coughs> famous line from Heidegger, so the life is chaotic strewn, a strewness into the world, which means you're left completely fragmented, open, open to the injury and discovery. And if that process is no longer in, in the reading or writing, then what's the purpose of it? of expression. So I think Love is Just Cause is just one of my books. I, you know, continued my way of narration. Lauren, is that right? Mm. Yeah, 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 no, I think that sounds right. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I was just having um, thoughts about another question that I was getting ready to ask you if, if necessary. Yeah, um, down at the front. I just here? Right here. My Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you so much. Um, I found what you said about, um, I found it all fascinating, but <laughs> particularly fascinating, um, what you said about like withhold, <clears throat> finding it difficult, or withholding from collective things, because to write, to, I think that's what you're saying, to write, you have to sort of keep the experience close and to sort of, with, yeah, withhold it in some way. And uh, yeah, I really related to that. And until you brought up the Balzac quote, and I think Flaubert wrote, it's what wrote about exactly that as well. Like, it really doesn't, it hasn't, I haven't come across many people talk about that. That sense that if you sort of participate, you kind of risk, um, mm. yeah, risk. Something. Absolutely, absolutely. I think, I think filmmaking the same, you know, being the writer the same. Um, is you, you, I feel, you know, I refuse to communicate <laughs> when, when I'm writing a project. You know, I do, you know, I'm friendly, you know, in the street. I uh, over-friendly because I feel guilty all the time, so I smile to anyone I don't know. But, oh, plus, I can't see very well, so I just smile. But, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, it's intensity, you know. I, I think I'm, I'm addicted to the, the, way, the way of release, release that intensity in your own writing rather than I mean, I also damage life too. You know, I, I do, I, I do intensify the, the, the person who, who were with me, you know, the, the, in my life too. But the very, I'm very selective, which means I'm economical, completely economical to my materials for my film and for my books. I cannot see how could I, you know, be a, 
comedi comedian and they write books. I mean, a lot of great comedians, they write good books too, but I do think it's a completely different way of writing. And also another thing is about dictating to your computer. Because the way I write is through this mental silent intensity. You know, it's, it's here, and I think when I dictate to the computer, is it speech, is is a writing through the, the sound. I found it completely alienating, and I had to revise when I, you know, I, I tried to do that. And I said, well, that, that's nothing interior. But maybe we don't need interior language on the page. Maybe we need a speech language, you know. So I, I find very difficult to adapt to that kind of speech dictating writing. But then, again, I'm a, you know, a very private writer. I think that the writers I love, you know, like, like I mentioned, you know, people like Annie Sning or, or George Perrick, especially Perrick, they had such a hidden private life. You know, so I'm sure there's a lot of amazing personality, like, you know, like Hemingway, for example. You know, they lived this outgoing, this, you know, war correspondent, this kind of incredible social life, but I just don't have that. Hmm. Yeah. Somewhere in her journals, Susan Sontag writes about this. Like she's like, I've got to stay in more because I go out and then I talk and talk and talk and like talk the essay away and there it goes and then I've forgotten what I said. Now I think if she were around, she'd have a smartphone and it would be recording all of her conversations. She'd feed it into the you know transliterator thing anyway. Um, yeah, I totally, I get what you're saying. I do find it's useful when I'm kind of walking around the city to dictate something into my notes. Um, that I'm just thinking about as I walk or responding to a podcast that I'm listening to, um, to have those notes when I get home later to then take them and build something more interior, as you say, from them. Um, so, yeah, we like, we like technology. Maybe Perak would have a smartphone too. Maybe not, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. um, anyone else other from, from the internet or in the room? Um, when you talk about being a very private writer, um, I was wondering now, obviously, as a, as a successful published author, um, how do you reconcile that private nature with the fact that you know other people are going to be reading your writing? Um, how do you interact with your reading audience? Do you find that helpful? Does that feed into the process, or is it distraction? Um, how has your writing evolved yeah. as you've met with success? Well, thank you. But I don't feel I'm a successful writer. <laughs> but I, it's funny. I, I think because I don't read the reviews and I never really look at the stars. I, I'm very neurotic, so I don't want to read any of that. But, but I think, I wonder, you know, this is very boring. Maybe it's very Freudian, but it's to his early, early life. Um, I somehow I always constantly felt I'm just uh, on the edge. I'm, I'm, some kind of marginalized personality in this society which encourage, promote a much more mainstream personality. And I'm very not that kind of personality, which made me a strange teacher. You know, I teach a lot in different universities. And I guess, I don't know if I'm polluting the youth or, pro <laughs> or not, you know, I, I, because I promote things completely non-standard. The, 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 the moralistic society promoting that quality, and I do not, and I despise of the, most of those qualities. So, and that's why I think I, I don't, I never feel I'm being, you know, in that position of successful. But talk about privacy, I don't know. I felt very much not in the sense of anything. I very much not in the center, and I refuse to take the centralized news, you know, anything to do with I, whatever, you know, whatever Prince Harry, I can't even say a name, or whatever Meghan's name, you know, like those things on the news, like I boycott them immediately. So I'm very, very angry person in a sense. My anger is so deep, so sickening that I, I boycott a lot of things and I do not talk about it with my people or, you know, my students because 99% of things I boycott already and then I don't share, so I become very politely smiley all the time because I don't participate. And, the, and the therefore I have this very strange, this core, which is quite painful, intensity core in me, which is completely non-collaborative. 
and I call that privacy. So I don't know if I explained that well. Um, but I found that useful when you, when you try to express, you know, on form. You know, I, I do rely on that. But thank you for the question. Hi. Um, so I feel like we're going to circle a lot back to this idea of fragmentation. Um, you've talked a lot about this theme. And um, I was kind of introduced to your writing as a, as a bilingual, as a multilingual writer, and I thought that was, that was kind of what drew me to you event, uh, initially, because as someone who's grew, grown up multilingual, I've always felt my identity was very fragmented by what I spoke at home, what I spoke in my day-to-day, -day, et cetera. And it's only as I've grown up that I've kind of felt like my language has kind of united in a way. So reading your writing, I, especially in um, Concise Dictionary, I remember there was this, this one uh, uh, chapter where there's just this burst of Mandarin, of Chinese, and I find that so enlightening because there was this sort of clarity all of a sudden, and I don't know, it was the first time in that book that I felt like there was a kind of united thing. I wondered, I, I wanted to ask you, like, do you feel writing bilingually, and you know, you talked about the sort of labor of writing as you were learning English and the conjugation struggle, do you feel like your writing has evolve, uh, has been uniting for you? Like, do you feel like your identity has been united through writing bilingually, or do you still feel like, mm. or have you ever felt like there's a fragmentation there mm. in languages? Mm. Great question. You know, I, I use this, um, the reader's text called uh, Monolingualism in my previous novel called A Lover's Discourse, and I did a section called Monolingo. And uh, my character in the book said, well, I feel I'm monolingual, even though I do speak a few languages. And I, as a, as a writer who is speaking here, I'm absolutely monolingual, even though I'm speaking English and I can speak Chinese and I can speak Hakka. I could speak another European language, maybe. But I'm completely monolingual in the sense is language precedes us before we were born. We were born nakedly, adopting those language which was imposed upon us. So that's very much Noam Chomsky's, you do not speak language, language speaks for you. Language is this incredible structure, narrative structure, you just, you speak arbitrarily, trivially different linguistic sense of language. You might speak French or German or, you know, but this is just technical sense. But this profound language there is overshadowing us, you know, and I think in this book I also quoted um, was it a Heidegger or something? I think it's Heidegger. It's, it's, it's a language precedes us. We were born with language, whether you speak it or not. And I think it's from Heidegger. It's, it's, I profoundly felt <laughs> monolingual all the time, even though I do speak many languages. I, I wanted to talk about it does not, monolingual or multilingual do not make huge difference when you write. It does make a difference when you use different vocabulary, uh, different private lexicon. Well, uh, not right yet. But the language is a superstructure, as Noam Chomsky said, is imposed upon you. The way you narrate, the way I try to convey my, my understanding of language to you is spoken by me as this little agency called Xiaolu Guo, but it's not me speaking. It is this incredible language machine we human inherited called uh, cognitive ability. <laughs> I, I couldn't make it clear because I do need to study a PhD to, to speak properly about this issue. But I do feel, you know, I'm writing under this spell of this huge narrative structure. You know, have, I adopt a particular school which might be from, you know, the French 60s or New Wave or Romanov, you know, that time, you know, in the European time, that 60s. That's just the writing style. But the way I speak is, is monolingual. <laughs> it's, it's a human language. Um, and, and also another thing to answer your question, I hope I, we still have one minute, mm -hmm. is to, to answer about the fragmentary or fragments. Um, I think, I think frag fragments is the only truth of narrative. It's the only, only truth of human life. It's very temporary. And if we do not narrate that way, then we are 
have this great vanity about self and about narrative. So I tried to write a book without fragments, but we will see. I'm doing it now. <laughs> uh, we have another online question. This one's from Aidan. Well, it's two questions, actually. Um, thank you, Jalou, for sharing. This has been an hour. Uh, has been, like your book, stimulating and interesting. Would you mind sharing your recommendation for your personal favorite Chinese language author? Mm. And also maybe uh, a favorite English language author as well. Great. I, it's very difficult to say one <laughs> favorite because, <laughs> because I do not believe in one God. So I can't, can I give one favorite? That's so unlogical. Well, unreasonable. Sorry, wrong word. Uh, for the Chinese authors, of course, you know, these are very big names, but they do, they do stay with me. Lu Xin from 1930s Shanghai. And, uh, you know, you can read Lu Xin's essays or the famous book called uh, The Diary of a Crazy Man. And Eileen Chang, again, southern Chinese writer from 1930s, pre-war time. She immigrated to the U.S. And uh, there's loads of novels from Eileen Chang. They're wonderful. Also, they were adapted into films by Ho Xiao Shen and uh, other filmmakers. And uh, the modern Chinese author, I think one, I actually just wrote a review for, for this book called The Golden Age by Wang Xiaobo, who died in, uh, in the 1990s when I was in the university. And he's absolutely a master of Chinese literature. So I think one of his most famous essays called uh, The Silent Majority, great title, and sums up everything about China. <laughs> and uh, so Wang Xiaobo is real, real, real incredible thinker, you know. And of course, I have a lot of other names, but uh, just to save time, the English author, I change every few years. You know, when I came to Britain, I couldn't read proper old literature, so I pick up sort of journalistic but good. You know, for example, I was very much into George Orwell's books, and I think particularly this one, Down and Out in Paris, London, which I made a film based on that book. And I loved Orwell's essay because the prose talks to me without fabrication of religious connotation, which I can't get it. I do not know Bible. So, so this straight, lucid prose from Orwell. And then later on, of course, you know, I, I was able to read more English literature in English. So, I mean, those names I think we mentioned tonight. Um, but um, D.H. Lawrence, definitely, I love. And E.M. Foster, absolutely. And Virginia Woolf, which Lawrence expert, but uh, she's very difficult to read, but uh, have this magnetic quality for women, for, for I think for any woman writer, how can you not <laughs> read a Woolf, right? So being shaken. Um, so Woolf will be always, yeah. But then, you know, I, I don't want to say one. I, I think there's a lot of to discover. And, and I didn't mention any European one, but I'm sure you know much better in Europe, yeah. We, yeah, how are we on time? Well, we can, we Sorry? Can, we can go to book sales now if you like. Mm. Can you say it into the microphone? Uh, we are just lovely for time, but we could also... A couple more questions? If we have them in the room. Okay. How about we take the final one and... Uh, yeah, we've got one back there. This can be the last one. Oh, no pressure. Um, <laughs> Uh, you just to touch back on the um, theme of separation, which um, came up quite a lot, and uh, you use a lot of words like fragmentation and disorientation, and all of these words kind of really invoke an image of of loss and of something missing. So, I guess my question is: Do you think that that separation that you speak of is primarily about self-loss or self-discovery? Mm. Yeah, it's a beautiful question. I mean, you already answered me. It's both. <laughs> it's both. I mean, actually, the original book title was um, when, I, when I worked on this called the um, Etymology of Separation. And I think I didn't stick with that title because I thought, Actually, not only about separation, it's also about unification of, of the self, you know, the split self in different cultures and languages. So it, it, it's almost given too much of this focus on, on the idea of separation, but this book, this is a book of separation about separated from my native culture, from my landscape, which is agricultural landscape. From my parents, they're all dead. 
from my just a it's kind of layer of you know a language as well because I grew up with Hakka and then I do not speak when I was when I left the south then I spoke Mandarin and then then I completely separated with those languages because I wrote with Chinese for 10 of my books. And then I came to the, U to the UK, then I adopted the English language, you know, and I barely could spoke, you know, now go back to those languages or... Um, I think also just uh, the artificial separation I needed for my life, for my... this. <laughs> this, the agency of myself, you know, I, I deliberately separate my, my little life, you know, with, with, with the person, with the people I live. I feel it's healthy to, to be away, to be detached sometimes, in order just to see my sanity. <laughs> um, so I think your question, you know, it, it's also about reconnect, because if you do not know what separation, then you cannot connect anymore, you know, so it's so important. And I think, I guess with this book, it's really about after this layer of separation, how do I find and lo locate that self again, you know, as, as, as a person who expresses? Because a lot of people do not express, and I do express, you know, and I, even in a painful way. Thank you. Okay, I think we'll probably leave it here. I know that Shailu's books are all here if you want to have a look at them. And the Lawrence and books are also there well, so yes. to sign. And Shailu will be very happy to sign them and you can ask her more questions, you know, in a kind of more subtle one-to-one -one setting. <laughs> but thank you so much for tonight and thank you to the British Library for having us. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> Big round of applause.